So I'm going to weave together two themes for you today, time and materials. So let's start with materials. They're tangible. It's everything that we humans mine, synthesize, cut, melt, bolt, and form into all the things that we use every day in our modern civilization. Time, on the other hand, can't be touched and can't be stopped. You might say something like, geez, this TED Talk is a waste of time. But, but the time doesn't actually go anywhere. During that time, there's still an effect on your life, and your life is having at least a small effect on everything around you. So this very concept of waste is a human invention. With materials, we might say, oh, done with this product, I'm going to throw it out. I'm going to throw it away. But it doesn't actually go away. It just goes to the landfill on the other side of town. I think this concept of waste is the most dangerous human invention of all time. Because in nature, waste doesn't exist. There is no waste. Everything is food for something else. Nothing is superfluous. So if we're going to build a sustainable future here on planet Earth, we need to take some lessons from nature. And when we're making materials, we need to look closely at the environmental impacts, the energy, and the time that it takes to make everything around us. So I want to start off with a simple question for you. How long does it take to make this piece of styrofoam? Well, if you're a plant manager and an expanded polystyrene expansion and molding facility, you might say, our cycle time is three seconds per part. But I'm looking for the whole answer. Because this styrofoam started off with the long lives of algae and plants and dinosaurs that were transformed over 65 million years into oil. And then we used some of the most advanced technology and the most expensive technology ever developed to suck this oil out of the most inaccessible nooks and crannies on our planet. We transported it on tankers and pipelines and trucks to refineries and expansion facilities, and then it became this styrofoam. And this styrofoam is used for a few weeks to protect your shiny new gadget, and then what'd you do? Threw it away. But it doesn't actually go away. It goes to the landfill. Styrofoam and other plastics take up about a quarter of our landfills by volume here in the US. Unfortunately, it doesn't all make it there. It can easily end up as litter or find its way to the Pacific Ocean gyre. And what's happening is that the styrofoam essentially will never biodegrade in any case. So in the Pacific Ocean gyre, the ocean will break it into smaller and smaller bits, and then it'll get confused by fish and sea creatures as krill and, and a tasty treat. So we're literally poisoning our planet. This is a timeline of the life cycle of styrofoam. So this brown line here represents 65 million years that it took to make the oil. And the light blue line represents the end of life. And I've got it dotted because there's some disagreement about how long styrofoam will last. Some people will say it'll last tens of thousands of years. Some people will say it'll last hundreds of thousands of years. And some people will say it'll never biodegrade. And frankly, we haven't had any of it around long enough to really know. So what's missing here is the use phase, those few weeks when the styrofoam is actually doing what we made it to do, protecting your product. The use phase, whether it's packaging being used for a few weeks or insulation being used for 50 years in your home, is less than one pixel on this screen. So clearly, these materials don't fit any sort of human time scale. They don't fit any biological time scale at all. If we're going to build a sustainable future here on Earth, we need to build this better future with sustainable materials. And I would argue that to be truly sustainable, these materials must be renewable materials. Our human recycling systems are really great, but they're not perfect. We'll never reach 100% recycling rates. And when we recycle things, it takes a lot of energy to take your plastic bottle. And then we're really downcycling it into shorter polymers and lower value products. On the other hand, nature has its own recycling system. It's called composting. And it's 100% efficient. Everything is food for something else. There's no waste. And you don't have to power your nature's recycling system with a coal plant. It's 100% efficient. So what renewable materials do we have to work with? Luckily, we live on the most wondrous planet that we've ever discovered. On Earth, we have 50 million species of unique organisms, and each one of these species creates its own unique biomaterials. So this is the phylogenic tree of life. It's sort of our tool shed of all the materials that we have to work with here. Now, I'm not saying we should take endangered species and turn them into fur coats, no way. Um, but what I am saying is that we can take some lessons from nature, and in some cases, we can learn to responsibly adapt what already exists to meet our human needs. So this phylogenic tree thing is a bit complicated for all the non-biologists out there. I'm going to simplify it. So what renewable materials do humans typically use? Well, mostly we use plants. My shirt is made from cotton. The stage is made from wood. 
So I've got another question for you. How long does it take to make this cardboard box? Well, obviously, cardboard comes from trees. We need nice long fibers to make tough craft paper. And it takes about 15 years to grow this tree. And then we cut it down, we pulp it up, we form it into sheets, we corrugate it and glue it and cut it, and then you get this box. So that's a lot better. That's within a human time scale for sure. So what about the world record holder, bamboo? It grows up to four feet vertically in one day. It's really an incredible plant. If you want to grow bamboo into this six-story scaffolding, which is pretty common in Asia, it takes about three years to get the girth and the strength required uh, to create this. And I want to pause here and point out the difference between raw materials and finished form, because what bamboo is doing is really special. So if I told you to grow a renewable structural tube and you'd never seen bamboo before, you might t spend 15, 20 years growing a tree and then slice it up into sections, create some sort of glue, and glue it into a tube. But with bamboo, it's just self-assembling straight into the finished form. It's really elegant, efficient, and beautiful. And if you've got a lot of patience, like this guy, Peter Cook, you can grow a chair. You can manipulate trees to just grow straight into a chair. So, so most of us grow trees, chop them down, saw them into planks, mine metals, create screws, uh, come up with chemicals for glues and paints. Not this guy. You just grow a chair. I think this is so, so cool. <laughs> All right, so what else do humans have to work with for renewable materials? Well, sometimes we use animals. So my shoes are leather, my socks are wool. This table looks kind of shiny. It might be coated in shellac. Well, shellac comes from the lac beetle. What else do humans work with? Well, more recently, we've learned to harness bacteria to grow some really amazing bioplastics and biomaterials. So today, we can take E. coli or other bacteria and grow something that works a lot like petroleum-based plastic. This is actually PLA, or polylactic acid, and it comes from bacteria. I'm going to stop here and take a drink. So another common PLA product that you've probably seen or maybe heard is kind of crinkly is the uh, compostable sun chips bag. It's also made from this PLA material. So how long does it take to make one of these? Well, in America, it all starts here at this $300 million facility in Nebraska. It takes a lot of chemical processing to transform this bacteria and bioreactors, this bacterial goop, into something that you can eat chips out of. But really, it doesn't start here. It starts on a cornfield. And that's because, like us, bacteria like to eat corn. And so we had to consider the time it took to grow the corn, to feed the bacteria, to create that chip bag. And it takes at least three months to grow corn, and then about a week for the bacteria to transform it into polylactic acid, which we can make into that chip bag. And so we're just feeding the bacteria the starch, just the meaty part of the kernel of the corn. The rest of the plant, it isn't necessarily waste, but we have to figure out some other use for it. And then the bacteria has a biological yield of about 6 to 15% of this usable PLA. So it's not super efficient, but it's a heck of a lot better than using petroleum-based plastics that took 65 million years to form. And I want to talk briefly about the end of life of these chip bags, because I got one of these and put it in my healthy home compost bin. And about four months later, I dug it up the other day. It's still there. It still looks pretty much the same. It's not composting the way that I expected it to, based on their claims. And so it's, it's not really home compostable. These chip bags will break down quickly in an industrial composting facility with really hot, high temperatures, but they don't work well in most home composters. And so I think we need to be careful about how we message these sorts of claims to consumers because compostability is a really good thing, but when something says it's compostable, we expect it to break down just like everything else in nature. So my team at Ecovative has discovered that the kingdom of fungi is this whole unexplored kingdom when it comes to materials. And it has some really remarkable materi material properties. So we're using mushrooms. And mushrooms are a key part of nature's recycling system. They can break down some tough compounds that almost nothing else in nature is capable of breaking down. We're actually not using mushrooms. We're using what's called mycelium. This is a scanning electron microscope of mycelium. It's sort of analogous to the root structure of mushrooms. So when you're hiking in the forest, you might see these little white strands uh, tying the soil together or bonding wood chips together. And that was really the inspiration for these materials, is realizing that mycelium is this natural self-assembling glue. It holds the forest floor together, and we can use it to grow some really amazing materials. So just like us and just like that bacteria, fungi needs food. Luckily for us, it'll eat things that basically nothing else will. It'll eat tough lignocellulosic compounds, like what you'd find in seed husks. 
So here in the Northeast, if we're making these materials, we can use oat husks. And if you're in the South, we can use cotton gin trash or rice husks. We can't feed these materials to cows. We can't eat them. They're not very useful for biomass energy. So this is another SEM image of mycelium. In the bottom right there, you'll see a cotton burr being consumed and enveloped by the mycelium. And then once the mycelium has finished eating that, it transforms that, that energy, that mass, into more mycelium, which starts branching out, and these little external stomachs start seeking out another particle. And at the same time, they're forming this strong, cohesive matrix that's bonding the whole thing together. So how long does it take to grow this stuff? Well, again, it starts as cotton gin trash. And unlike the corn, we're not going to count the time it took to grow the cotton, because it's already grown for some higher value use. And if we didn't use it, it would just be left on the fields, and it would rot. And most of the rotting would happen thanks to fungi anyways. So how long does it take to grow this into a packaging part to replace styrofoam? It happens in less than five days. It's really incredible. <laughs> so this is a quick time lapse. When I press go, you're going to see five days of growth in about 10 seconds. And I want you to watch those white dots as they grow and expand. Those white dots are the mycelium. And all the brown stuff is cotton gin byproducts. It's going to get glued together. So check this out. Go. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. And on day six, we dry it out, we kill the fungus, and it becomes this strong, beautiful biocomposite material. And that's why we call these materials ultra-rapid renewables. <laughs> <laughs> so today, instead of that old petrochemical styrofoam, we can use this eco-cradle. It performs just about the same, if not better, than styrofoam to protect your product, and it's cost competitive too. But unlike styrofoam, eco-cradle is 100% home compostable. It works with nature's recycling system. So when you get a product packaged in eco-cradle, you can crumple it up, toss it in your garden as mulch. You can compost it at home. It'll break down quickly the way you'd expect it to. You can put it into your yard waste, and you can send it to a landfill, too. It'll break down there. But we really want you to return those nutrients to nature. So today, we're operating a pilot plant in Green Island, New York, and producing thousands of these parts every month. We can mold them into just about any shape. And we can also tune the material properties, depending on what agricultural waste we put into it and how we grow the fungus. It sound like science fiction? It's not. Today, companies like Steelcase are using EcoCradle to package heavy office furniture. And they're replacing thousands of petroleum-derived foam parts every month. And Dell is now shipping servers with EcoCradle. They're trusting their big, sensitive servers to EcoCradle. But we see this as so much more than just packaging. It can be home insulation. It's R3 per inch, and it's a Class A fire rating. So it's actually much safer than the pink foam insulation you might be using today. And we can also make fun stuff, like boogie boards. <laughs> our our R&D team at Ecovative is constantly developing new blends of this material and new applications, from car parts to structural cores and furniture, and so much more. We want to replace plastics for almost everything. So I want to tie this all back to time and talk very quickly about the history of humans in relation to materials. So the Stone Age really began before we fully evolved into Homo sapiens. And then about 5,000 years ago, we started learning how to turn metals into useful materials. And this rapidly advanced human civilization and technology. But it, those advances were really nothing compared to how fast things have been going in the plastic age. Sometimes we forget that our grandparents got along just fine without any styrofoam. And, and today, we're living at a point in history where we know that we're running out of oil. And we know that plastic is polluting our planet. But we're still using plastics. And we mold and form them into just about everything imaginable. Plastics have become ubiquitous. And at Ecovative, we've just spent the last four years developing these materials, although you could argue, argue that fungi have been developing those materials for millions of years. But I think we're just barely scratching the surface of what's possible. If we're going to learn to live sustainably here on planet Earth, we need to rethink the way we make everything. We're at a point in history where we can't keep using plastics, and we need to find alternatives. I want you to avoid polluting plastics and to demand a future built with rapid renewable materials. Thank you.